Hello and welcome to the August Iowa Chapter Slideshow. Our presenter this month is going to be Darren Farragher. Hello, Darren. Hello. Yes, Darren and I have done several of these shows together. We're going to do a show, actually, of Darren's material this time. And um, we are going to be going back to the 1980s for this show, because I know that everybody here loves the 1980s. And we are going to be seeing... Uh, a little bit outside of the state of Iowa. We're going to be going to Colorado, Wyoming. Um, a little bit up in Canada. Yeah, a little, um, just some... So, yeah. I decided with this program I um, was going to do uh, something that we haven't done for a while, and that was to sort of step away from, from the state. Uh, so I, it's really been kind of a focus, uh, this program is going to be kind of a focus on the mountains or mountain passes. Uh, so, and a lot of places are shots you can't get anymore. It's not entirely true, but uh, uh, Tennessee Pass and so on. But you'll see that as we go through. So, we might as well get a run for it here. Uh, is there anything you need to announce, or are we good to go? Well, the announcement, I guess, would be for this show that we are coming up, and there are going to be local rail fan groups that are going to be starting their meetings. We're going to have our next, our first I should say Cedar Rapids Rail fans meeting we'll next be, week. Yeah, it'll be tomorrow, right? If this is if this is debuting on Sunday, Sunday. we're actually recording this on on August tenth, but showing on Sunday, the Cedar Rapids Rail fans will be tomorrow. Yes, uh, resuming again back at the, uh, the church on uh, Center Point Road, uh, St Andrew's Lutheran Church. And so, if you uh, are in the region and would like to join us, the doors open at six thirty with a program of seven. It's what we're calling Members Night, and so that is uh, anyone who has approximately 10 minutes worth of something to present will be available either in a slide format or a digital. We'll have a projector there of both formats. Uh, so you're welcome to you know show up with something. But again, keep in mind that there's a lot of people who are going to want to show, so we're going to limit it to approximately 10 minutes. Right. And I know that Dana Grief has got the Ames Area Rail fans organized, and they're going to be starting to meet in September in Boone at the Boone Scenic Valley Railroad Museum, and they're going to be having Stuart Buck for their first presenter out there. So they're they're getting ready to resume some programs as well. Nice. I haven't heard anything about what was happening in Cedar Falls. I know that they would like to get started again, but um, they are still, I think, limited a little bit by their facility and what the requirements are. Uh, hasn't been fully clarified, but uh, hopefully they'll get on the road up there too pretty soon. So. Yeah, so I know there's a lot of people from out of state that watch these programs, but I just wanted to do a little intro there for the, the local rail fans to make it sure that everybody knows that meetings are starting back up and there are places you can go to attend meetings in person again. And I think what's important for us to recognize is that we, for everyone who watches, regardless of where you're at, is we are going to try to continue these programs uh, through you know at least once a month. As long as we can continue to get programs and, and uh, we can convince Tom to continue to record them, uh, we're going to try to at least do uh, one or two programs a month for, uh, for the Internet. So enjoy these programs and hope they stay on for us for a while. But I think you're booked up pretty far in advance for right yes, now, Yes, right? we've got another six months of programs okay. lined up already. So, Well, if you're interested in putting on a program, you know, get a hold of Tom. Um, his information is, is below, and um, uh, you know, feel free to... We can, we can hook you up remotely, too. You don't have to travel to Marion, Iowa for presenting right. your program. So, Unfortunately, yes. they have to be digital. It's pretty hard to show slides uh, against the screen and have it transfer over to YouTube. But beyond that, uh, if you have the ability to pr put on a digital program, we'd love to have you. So, Yes. All right, so share with so us with what you got today, All right, Aaron. so um, back in 1982, uh, my father, who's also a rail fan, um, uh, got rid of, or I should say handed down his... Canon Demi camera to me, which was a half-frame camera he had purchased in Germany. And uh, it's about the size of two cell phones. You, if you push two cell phones together, so you could put it in your pocket. Um, it was a half-frame camera, which meant that for when you loaded it with 35 millimeter film, instead of getting 36 images, I could get 72, but they were very small. It was a manual exposure. It did have a meter on there, um, but it would take anything from ASA 10 film to ASA 400, which wasn't too bad considering that it was only a, a you know, 250th and an F22 fixed lens. Um, so, but with that, so some of our first shots here are going to be uh, images taken through this very camera. So we're going to start out uh, at Tennessee Pass. My parents uh, both had jobs that uh, they worked throughout the year, and my dad was a teacher, and so we only tended to travel in the summertime. 
and we almost always went west. My, my parents were western travelers and so we traveled in this little camper on the back of the truck. This is at Pando uh, on Tennessee Pass where the uh, 10th Mountain Division trained for the, for the military. Uh, back in back in the earlier days, steam era days, but this is 1982, and um, so here's our truck sitting out not too far off. I'm standing on the Rio Grande tracks on Tennessee Pass uh, at the beginning of the three percent grade. So from our campsite, we would uh, spend several days in this location. Um, we uh, would chase trains up and down between Pando and then up to the top of the hill or down towards Minturn. Uh, but here's an example of uh, one of the uh, uh, what I'll call southbound or eastbound trains at Pando, three on the front. Um, it was not unusual to have a, a lot of helpers. I mean, we would have, you know, nine in this particular shot. So now we're at, uh, you know, 12 locomotives. Sometimes there'd be some on the rear. Um, but uh, the longest or the most number of locomotives we ever saw on a train was 19 engines. I did not throw that series in here. Uh, I brought a series of 17, but I didn't throw in the 19. Um, you ever see them lift a car off of a curve? No. With the helpers? Uh, uh, no. Uh, I know there was a runaway here um, several uh, years just prior to when the line was closed down uh, that had some chemical spills and so on, caused some damage. But I'm sure things must have happened, but we never saw anything that was necessarily... Um, uh, derailment problems. We saw problems, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little later on, but um, uh, here's a train that's climbing the 3%. Uh, he's just about to round the curves near Pando. He's got five on the point, nine cut in. Here's the second half of those nine. And, you know, the interesting thing is, is Rio Grande used high horsepower units, but they were not always six axle units. You know, a, a, you, you, f you could put that 3,000 horsepower to the rails, you know, at 10,000 feet, you're not quite getting that full 300 or 3,000 horsepower, but uh, uh, they were pretty content with six or four axle units. And the three on the rear shoving. Of course, now these are tunnel motors here, so. Is this a loaded coal train that yes. we're shoving? Yes. And uh, so 17 engines. Uh, that's wonder why they decided not to uh, continue to use this line after the UP merger. It was just couldn't have been the most efficient way to move a coal train. Nice real grand caboose. Now you can see that with the uh, half frame size and the um, uh, the speed of film, which was probably 64, um, we do have a little bit of graininess. Some of it has to do with the fact that we had to scan a you know a really tiny uh, image, not quite as small as the 110s as some people remember, but uh, still. Yeah, we're blowing them up on a pretty big monitor. We're blowing them up pretty big here. here. So after the, sh the train sh shoved up out to the top of the hill, then this is the uh, uh, nine helper units returning back down to Minturn where they were based. Uh, you can see U.S. Highway 24 in the background. This is really a cool area if you ever vacation in Colorado. The, the, the track is still in place, but of course the line's been abandoned for, I don't know what it's been now, 18 years, 20 years? Yeah, what are they, they consider it abandoned or embargoed? Embargoed, I think, yeah. is a better term. And there was a... Um, a movement for a company that wanted to start running trains over the line again and the towns are not having it they don't want the noise anymore and of course it's the sort of nimby yes. uh, mentality which i can see from their perspective but uh i don't know how anything efficiently could happen on this line uh, with the movement of trains other than you know it'd be really fun to have a tourist road or something right this is in the um, eagle river canyon uh, this is really quite a spectacular bridge the red cliff bridge um, so you can uh, stand on top of the bridge and see the helper set continuing working their way down. They're coming toward us. Mostly Jeep 40s in this set, They're I think. All EMD power. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Rio Grande was almost all, well, they were all EMD yep. uh, in this era. A I guess there's a tunnel motor in the end, yeah. Otherwise, it looks like all GB 40s. Mm hmm. You can't go wrong with the scenery out here, though. No kidding. Now, some of this was was double track, uh, and then single track with sightings uh, in this in the '60s. Of course, a lot of the big articulate engines that the Rio Grande had were used on the line. And if you do some searching uh, on the Denver Public Library website, you can find lots and lots of archived shots of the uh, of the Rio Grande articulated engines working Tennessee Pass. One of the great, truly great 
passes in the country. Here we are back up at Pando, US Highway 24. A Rio Grande Jeep 30 in the lead there, the 3008. Looks like yeah, the rest of my a... GP40s. Yep. 3000 series. Here's his helper sets, just six of them this time. All in run eight, pushing like heck. This is, Pando is really the start of the 3% from there to the top of the grade, which is an additional, oh, I don't know what it's about eight miles up there or so, I think, is where they're really all out. This is um, a little bit closer to a town called Pine Cliff. Now this is on the, on the uh, Moffat line, uh, Pine Cliff, is just down the hill from the Moffat Tunnel. This is an eastbound train um, that's uh, heading down more towards the Coal Creek Canyon area. A couple of Jeep 30s in there. Yep. Yeah, they were dirty. Mm -hmm. I suppose if you spend half your life in a tunnel, you're going to get pretty grunged up. Yes. Now, this is from the uh, back at the uh, Eagle River Canyon that I t showed the images of earlier. We were on top of the bridge before, and then the road makes a curve off, and there's a pull-off, but you can see another helper set coming down the hill. That's a water street down below that heads down to a little town called Red Cliff, which we'll see shots from a little later on in this program. Yeah. Back at Pando, another eastbound train, southbound train. MP boxcar head out. Yeah. Yep. Who we got a tunnel motor and a couple of GP4. Oh, I'm sorry, tunnel no. motor and a 40 and a tunnel motor. Yeah. Here's his helper set. Looks like nine units. I've been trying to pay attention to the numbers. I'm not sure if you're seeing the exact same helper set every time, but real similar for it's sure. It's probably. I, it, Assuming the, all these shots were taken on the same trip, you know, we would go out there almost every year. And so when I was pulling images, I wasn't necessarily paying attention to the date. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm guessing that it, it's probably pretty close to the same sets. Right. Now we're going to move over to Wyoming. This is on uh, the Sherman Hill line of the UP. Uh, this is Thai Siding on Hermosa Road. Um, this is where the three tracks mains have come together up the hill, uh, Dale Creek. Uh, this is a westbound train just in dynamics working his way down towards Laramie. Um, still a neat place to watch trains and one of the few places on Sherman Hill where the, all three mains are together. Uh, the, realign, the realigning main that was built by Morrison Knudsen, you know, splits off again uh, uh, to go to Laramie. So tie sightings, mm -hmm. the one spot you get both eastbounds and westbounds. So you, what is the sign that's along the side of that second well so the up for a while put um uh little sayings on the side of the some of the 40-2s as they did their cabooses something like they would say something like uh, a second glance your living chance or um gosh what were some of the other ones uh, great big rolling railroad or things like that so that particular locomotive has a sign on the side okay. and, and i probably shot it off but i didn't pick it out because i didn't think about how that doesn't exist anymore. I right. should have picked out the second shot for you. Way uh, Western Pacific caboose on the train. Yes, this would have been. I'm guessing we're after 1983 here. We're somewhere right in that territory, but you yeah. know, it was not unusual. And we would go to North Platte in the 70s. My dad has shots of 13 and 14 different railroads uh, in the North Platte shops area. So you know, there was lots okay. and lots of of, uh, of of pool service going on with all the different both east and western roads and okay. sometime i'm going to convince him to put together some stuff we'll do a program of 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 the west up west um west of north platte you know in the in the 1970s because there's some tremendous images there yeah so here's another one here fuel fuel conservation rail transportation yeah um, but yeah the 40-2s uh, a lot of them had those signs on the side you saw a lot of SP power, especially west of North Platte. <clears throat> Sometimes you'll see a train that would have one 40-2 of the UP and the other five units would be SP power uh, between tunnel motors and 45s and SD40s and I mean yeah, everything. Yeah, there's lots of pooled power yeah. out that way. Yeah, Western Pacific power in the earlier days, Milwaukee, of course BN. Right. Uh, there's a BN unit as a matter of fact. Yeah, a big U-boat. Yep, a big snoot on the front there. Oh yeah. 
So this was probably originally an 8000 series engine that's been renumbered to the 3200 series. The 8000s were the fast 40s. Uh, the snoots were on there for uh, um, uh, radio control equipment so they could talk to helper sets. Yes, uh, we had one of those that I recall having on the uh, IC&E. Was it a former Santa Fe engine or was it a no, former UP? No, it was UP. Okay. Almost all the SD40s that we had on the IC&E were, they were either XCP okay. or XUP Mopac. Okay. Yep. Yeah, those noses were 116 inches long. Yeah. It's <laughs> just huge. You always noticed it because it was so much more difficult to get around the front of the... Well, and I suppose just even seeing from the engineer's perspective, I had never really considered that, that you know, just having that extra length of nose yep. for grade crossing and so on. This is a... Um, this is an eastbound train coming up grade. These were the CA11 style cabooses. On UP cabooses, if you look at the middle number, you take the, like for example, the number eight here and add three, that's an 11, and that makes it a CA11. And that's how they did all their cabooses throughout the years. So when people look at them and go, well, that's a CA9, and mm -hmm. all people have said, how do you know that? It's like, well, simple, you take the six and add three. But um, these were built uh, as relatively new cabooses in the, in the early to mid 1980s. And so uh, it was just considering the fact they were built in the 80s and not too much longer, cabooses went away. You know, these right. were pretty new cars to be on the roster and didn't run as long as the auto rack does to the right, for example. You know, a lot of those are still running today, of course. Now you'll notice that uh, he's on the left-hand track and that was the operation out here is, was left-hand running. The, the lesser grade coming out of Laramie to the east was uh, to, to be left-hand running. The steeper grade was uh, the line split uh, just beyond the signals there, and and the shorter, steeper grade uh, down to Laramie was uh, was on the left-hand track. Yeah. And the Morrison Knutson rebuild on the uh, east side of the of the grade was also you know left-hand running out of Cheyenne. Tunnel motor and an SD45 along with the U-boat in the lead. Yes. More snoots, more signs. Standard cabs. <clears throat> yep. You think about how big of a deal it was when the set when the CP ran that set of standard cabs down to a Tumla a couple months ago. Right. And here you use just everything. Well, wide cabs, other than some stuff on the, um, uh, well, gosh, who had wide cabs? The Canadian National had a couple of things, and then. There was a few of those uh, Seaboard Coastline engines, but there was no such thing as wide cabs in, in this era. I right. mean, I suppose you could argue that you might have something like a U50C or something that would be a, a wide cab, but nobody called them that. I mean, no. the wide cabs didn't come into existence until, what was that, about 1989 or so, that when the 6089 of the UP appeared. Yeah. Um, otherwise. Early 1990s, I guess, is what yeah. I usually think of them. Sure. Yeah, but, like the some of the very last power that the CMW got, for instance. Right, right. And yeah. like all the light clusters of the SP units between the, the oscillating lights and the emergency light in the nose. Almost like a steam engine. Yeah. Yes. Class lights. So we're still obviously in the same place along Sherman Hill here. We would we would also camp at Tice Siding. We would park. There's a parking lot across the street on the north side that we would sometimes sit there and, and spend a night or two along the UP. And, of course, the traffic was probably... You'd average maybe two to three trains an hour in those days, which was, you know, certainly fair traffic. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't hear them coming very much, though, because by the time you could hear the ones coming out of out of Laramie because they were pulling hard. But the um, the westbound trains, uh, all of a sudden the crossing signals would start, you know, the bell would start ringing and you'd have to run out there because they'd roll past you, you know, at, at about 50, 60 miles an hour. And they'd just start getting the dynamic brakes about in this area because the rear of his train is is probably cleared the tunnel but not by much and so they were pulling pretty hard until recently and then they'll they would coast down grade at, at 65 70 miles an hour in dynamics into laramie because it was mostly straight track yeah and five and six sd40s on a piggyback was very normal this is of course after uh after the centennials uh were taken out of service and they were put back in service again for a little while uh, but i didn't i didn't myself shoot any centennials in regular service until the um, uh, the 69, uh, what the heck is the number of the UP's operating Centennial? Uh, anyway, until the more recent uh, yeah. service with the, with the Centennial. I can't think of the number. The one that's been it. preserved. Yes. And yes. I, I, funny, I can't think of its number. Crazy. So 
same train, obviously. Yep. Looks like a very new signal bridge also. Yeah. We um, saw a cantilever signal bridge in an earlier shot. This one is much more modern. Right. And, of course, in the earlier days, you know, you, you had to have... Um, the rule was that the signal had to be on the engineer side of a steam locomotive, and so signal bridges were a lot more common in the steam days, but in this mm -hmm. case with three tracks, the only way you could really signal that middle track with the spacing that the tracks were in those days. You know, track spacing has changed over the years. They're much farther apart now than they used to be uh, because of a rule that once they were a certain distance apart, uh, track crews could continue working when a train passed. Right. But in this era, you know, everybody stopped if there was a train approaching. So, so we've got... Three GEs and a right. and an SD40 maybe. Yep. Pulling upgrade. Yep. Eastbound. Milwaukee caboose on this guy. Yes. With UP system hoppers. Yeah, that wasn't uncommon. Um, you'd see BN cabooses. You'd see you know, uh, and gosh, WP stuff. I've got shots of WP cabooses, and you know, of course, mm -hmm. I've got. You know a slide collection that's huge and so when you have to only pull 120 130 shots you uh, become pretty limited on what you grab yeah this is taken over in uh, Washington State along US Highway 2 just some beautiful cascade green against the, all the green trees yeah. there one of their b30-7 a's which was actually a B units back there the third out mm-hmm you can see Highway 2 in the, up above there. Yep, ducking into the tunnel. We had parked and uh, uh, walked down the hill to get this shot. And as we were watching the train go past, my dad walked over and said, Hey, you know, it just occurred to me, you know, we're in bear country here, so uh, keep your eye out. Or <laughs> if you're not sure, we can head back to the truck. You have a harbinger there of things to come, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> It'll be an SF, sort mm -hmm. of. Now we're going to jump up into Canada for a minute. Um, this is uh, in Banff, British Columbia. Uh, this is the Canadian, which in these days, well, even today is still running the original Bud cars from the late 1940s, early 1950s. The Fs are gone, but uh, yeah, the same passenger cars are still running. But this is uh, this was a fantastic looking passenger train mm -hmm. with four Fs and probably about 18, 19 cars. I don't remember exactly. Some domes. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're going to go through the Canadian Rockies, yeah, I'm you, yeah, this this would be the way to do it. Yep. If you're going to go through any Rockies, this would be the way to do it. Here we are at the Cascade Tunnel. Um, this is interesting because this was a test run of the then new B32-8s from GE, the 54, 97, 98, 99. The 90, you can see on the left side of the handrail, there's a whole bunch of wires kind of coming out of the cab and skirting along the underframe because the GE test car was back there. Um, and they cut it actually in between the engines. Right, and we didn't know that this was coming. We had just stopped to see the Mappa Tunnel. We could hear a train coming through the tunnel and got mm -hmm. this shot and thought, well, this is quite interesting. Of course, not the Moffat Tunnel. You're no, no, Cascade the Cascade Tunnel. tunnel. Yes. And so we um, decided that this was the, about the poorest place we could have been to get a good shot of them. <laughs> so we uh, continued on down the hill to uh, Skykomish, Washington, uh, which is towards the uh, Seattle area and uh, uh, got a better shot of the train you'll see coming up here in a second. Here we are, this guy Comish. Yep. There was only three of these of the B32-8s and um, they later, you know, sort of evolved into the B39s and so on, but uh, they lasted for a while. I remember them in the... Um, uh, later 1980s, early 1990s, I got a shot of one of these three. I can't. I think it was the 5497, actually leading an Amtrak across Iowa. Uh, there had been some problems with one of the F40s, and and one of these GEs had to come to the rescue. So, and then this is a shot taken just outside of uh, somewhere between Skykomish and Seattle. I don't know exactly where we were, but this was from our campsite. We had you could open the back door of the camper, and this was the this was the view watching the. You know, it makes me realize we were talking about the wide cabs earlier. Yeah. Is that a, yeah, is I, that a 45 I, there in the middle? I didn't think about F45s. You know, F, yeah. FP45s is, quote, wide cabs. We didn't use them. Those would have been the original that's ones. That's true. We wouldn't have called them that, though, in those days. Yes. But yeah, that's true. So then I was lucky enough that I was able to switch over, and my next camera became a 35 millimeter A1. It was an SLR camera. Uh, it had an automatic meter exposure setting that they called program mode. You still had to manually advance the film. 
um, and you had to manually set the ASA setting. And of course, there's nothing worse than if you would have a mixture of films. And you know, of course, the, sl the slide guys are all like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, those of you who've never even probably shot a film camera have no idea the trials and tribulations of being a film photographer. Um, but so manual advance, of course, you know, you only got 36 shots or 24, depending on the, the s amount of film you bought. By this time, film was costing me $7 a roll. And it was probably costing, um, oh, I don't know, probably about 9 to $10 to process the roll. That was a lot of money for someone, you know, for me in 1986. I, I wasn't even working yet. Um, uh, it, you could do interchangeable lenses, which was nice because I had a, uh, the opportunity to purchase then a, um, a zoom lens, but it was not a lens that you could, it, it was uh, not a lens you could change at the time. So you either had the zoom on or you had the 50 millimeter lens on, which is kind of the standard lens that you see here. Uh, so if you wanted to do a, you know, a shot of the train coming, you could sort of put the lens in your pocket and put the zoom on and shoot it and then quick change lenses and so on. It was nothing like we're used to today with, uh, with photography. Oh, and I have to mention it was manual focus. And so you had to line up these two, there was sort of two images that were split as you look through the viewfinder and you had to kind of line up that split and that would tell you that it was in focus. Uh, but you know, it had a shutter speed from 1 30th to 1 1 1,000th, which was incredible because you know, the, the opportunity to have less of a blur with slower speed film was excellent. You could have some really nice images. So now we're going to jump to 1986 and, uh, do some shots around Palmer Lake, Colorado. Um, I went to Colorado, uh, 1986 was the year I graduated from high school and to celebrate my graduation, a friend of mine who worked with me at uh, the local hospital, I was in the food business, said, uh, let's go on vacation together and we went to Colorado camping and as part of that, he was a fisherman and I, Chris Lake rail fanning and so we chose Palmer Lake so he could fish and I could watch trains and the first train we caught was this one. And I saw these three, what I know now to be Oakway engines. Um, I thought they were EMD demonstrators and I had no idea what the heck I was seeing. Seven units coming around the corner here. Uh, of course, for those who know, the Oakways were a, a leasing program that the uh, EMD had and there were a hundred of them, uh, 9,000 series locomotives that uh, ran all over the BN system for quite a while. And I think a lot of them still exist as CN units, right? Repainted. Yeah, yeah. of course repainted. But um, uh, this, so this was the first train that I saw. The passenger operation was there in the background also. Did you catch that? Uh, oh, steam engine? oh, no, that, that was a... Um, that or was, was that a display? That was a display. It was an, an engine that was painted in kind of a, I think a Rio Grande paint scheme, but it was actually a Mexican locomotive that was on display for a while there in Palmer Lake. It just oh. was on a short section track and didn't last very long. It was probably there maybe eight to 10 years at the most, and it's no longer there. Uh, I don't know, whatever happened to it, where it came from, it was just, uh, it was there. And I didn't pull it out of the shot because I've shown it a lot of other programs before and wanted to conserve slide space for things that I thought were more important to show. Yes. So now we're gonna slide down to the town of Larkspur. Um, this is uh, between Denver and Palmer Lake. So the southbound trains are climbing. Um, the line over the, the, uh, the Palmer Lake line was actually two different railroads that crossed between Denver and Colorado Springs. It was the Santa Fe and the Rio Grande. And even though the BN ran on the line, they were a tenant of the two railroads, but the three operated the railroad as, as basically a double track. So the, uh, most of the southbound trains used the former Santa Fe track, except when you got right towards Palmer Lake, uh, they switched over to use the former Rio Grande track, and then the northbound trains, for the most part, used the former Rio Grande. I know that's confusing, but um, uh, it was a, a neat three-way operation, and it was a, at that time super busy line with the coal traffic. You got to see, you know, trains of the BN, trains of the Santa Fe, and trains of the Grand when they were the, all their own entities. Uh, so this bridge in um, Larkspur at Spruce Mountain Road is still in existence. I haven't seen it for a few years. I don't know if you can still read the Santa Fe logo on the side of it, but uh, it was always a favorite spot. This is the morning shot uh, of a southbound train, SD50 and a couple of tunnel motors pulling hard. So I had decided that first train that I showed, I had decided to chase it because again, I didn't know what the heck I was seeing. I thought I was getting some demonstrators. And so we chased it to Larkspur and this is on the Rio Grande side. So the train that I just showed with the Rio Grande power was a train that we'd intercepted as he was climbing the hill. And then we caught this guy in his full dynamics coming down into uh, down the hill uh, towards Denver. 
then I started realizing as we spent a few days in the area that seeing uh, the EMD Oakways was becoming a common occurrence. So then it became a party of how many Oakways could you get on a train? And my best one was six. <laughs> and I think that's pretty close to the record I know of anybody having. But uh, So six Oakways. In a uh, solid consist. On a solid consist, uh, southbound train. Uh, he's climbing uh, we're along uh, U.S. Highway 85 near Louvers, which is just south of Monument. I'm sorry, just north of Monument, uh, between Monument and Denver. I don't mean Monument, I mean Castle Rock, as I think about it. So the same bridge I showed earlier in Larkspur uh, for a southbound train, but this is taken from the other side. This was pretty common on the coal trains to have six unit, or five units in the lead, a combination of GEs and EMDs, and then traditionally there was at least two in the rear shoving. In most cases, they were SD40s, and they were either BNs or Santa Fe units. In this case, it was BN units, and of course, I said SD40s, and it showed me up with a couple of uh, GEs. But yes. uh, GEs made a nice sound in those days. They were very distinctive. Very distinctive and you know loud. Uh, unlike locomotives today, which are so... Uh, and don't start too governed. close to the tracks because you get sprayed with oil. <laughs> yeah. They didn't ride well, but they pulled well. Yes. Here we are back at Palmer Lake. There's your... Well, wait, are those pushers? <laughs> nope. These, those are, that's the head-end power. This is head-end power. So at, at, a, at Louvier's, there was a, um, a, a loading facility for uh, piggyback trailers. And every day... This was a, a short little jaunt. Some days it might have a one unit in one car. Some days it'd have two GP38s and 10 cars, but it would pull down towards Pueblo uh, and they would uh, tie in with the main line uh, to uh, send the tra uh, trailers either east or west. And so this was basically a transfer run that occurred every day between the south part of Denver down to the east-west main in southern Colorado, the Raton line. And I was really excited because as the train was coming along, the water was generally still, and I thought, oh, this is going to be one of those perfect reflection shots I've been trying to get for years. And then something, either a little wind kicked up or maybe some vibration from the locomotives, or they're just cresting the hill here. Maybe the cars bunched together. I don't know what caused the wave, but it's always been kind of a favorite shot. We're gonna, Now we're going to skip back up again uh, to uh, tie siding uh, in Wyoming. Um, my goal on this trip is I was trying to get some shots of the UPC 36-7s, which were a little bit of an unusual unit to see, certainly across Iowa, because you have to remember this is pre-Northwestern merger days. And so, uh, and they generally kept the C-36s west of North Platte. So uh, I decided to spend a little time up there to try to find some former UP, or should actually say former Missouri Pacific, they were ordered during the Missouri Pacific days, uh, C-30-7s. I don't mean that, C36-7s. And luckily, here's one that had two of them on there. And you can see that they were in Missouri Pacific lettering, but UP paint. Um, they were ordered kind of during the time of the merger of the Mopac and the UP uh, and delivered in this livery, so. I always thought this was kind of a bizarre, uh, maybe tip of the cap that the UP did, or however they decided that. Well, I, I think what really happened is that if you talk to a lot of the UP guys, the, the management of the UP was actually Missouri Pacific practices. And I'll never forget, there was this great cartoon that came out not long, not long after the merger. And it basically was a picture of, you know, like the Union Pacific corporate headquarters. And then there was a picture of like, you know, like, sort of today with the merger of the Mopac and the UP and it said this is your brain and it was the headquarters and then it said this is your brain on drugs and it was the Missouri Pacific mm -hmm. operating scheme. <laughs> uh, the UP guys did not like the fact that they were being run by the Missouri Pacific even though it was considered more of a UP merger. Right. So, so here's the C36-7s. They were ordered by Mopac. Uh, they were relettered soon after the shot uh, but they were 3750 horsepower uh, eventually relettered into UP and they didn't last real long. I thought they were kind of cool units. I like that box behind the cab. Okay, so back down to Palmer Lake. And recognizing that these two areas are only about three hours apart, so sometimes I'd, you know, in this particular trip, we'd spend a little time at Palmer Lake, and then we'd run up to Wyoming. Um, so Another merger there that didn't quite get pulled off. Yeah, there's so you can see the middle unit has the start of what was going to become the great Southern Pacific Santa Fe merger. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, 
They thought it was surely going to be approved uh, by the trans uh, transportation committees, and it didn't occur. But they had already started painting on the SP. You had the similar paint schemes, but it had SP with the uh, space ready for the SF as soon as that could happen, and then it didn't. Yes. And so some of these units ran around for a little while, but uh, yeah, that's hence the unusual paint scheme there. Nice point on that. Cheap 30 in the lead, that's a nice way to start out too. Right behind him is another train with Oakways. I'm up on the hill now at Palmer Lake. You unfortunately can't get this photo anymore uh, because uh, there's houses built where I'm standing, but they were not there in this days. Down below in this image, you can see the pavilion and uh, what looks like a roadway. That was the former Santa Fe main line. So at Palmer Lake, the Rio Grande and the Santa Fe lines eventually came together as a single track main between here and south of Colorado Springs. And so uh, all the trains bottlenecked and it wasn't unusual to have trains sitting in Palmer Lake ready to get onto the single track main. In this case, this guy's ready to come off the main. But the trail that you see down below was the former Santa Fe line that ran on the left side of the lake or the east side versus the Rio Grande, which ran on the west side. Now we're down a little town called Monument. Uh, I had happened to see a train as I was driving around and couldn't catch him at Palmer Lake, and so went down to Monument to try to collect it because it had, uh, I think, six or seven units on it, but I couldn't find a spot to get them all together. So the first unit I'll back up was uh, this Jeep 39, it looks like, and then uh, a couple of 45-2s in the ready-to-be-relettered SPSF mm -hmm. scheme a Jeep 35, a Snood SD40, uh, two Snood SD40s, so nice train. Unfortunately, I couldn't get all the counts just in one shot. But uh, I was looking on Google Earth a couple of days ago and noticed that the Rio Grande overpass here is still at a Rio Grande. It's faded, but from the Google Earth roadway, whatever, you can still clearly read Rio Grande on the side of the bridge wow. in Monument. This is Highway 105. And of course they ran cabooses in those days still, so I was always a fan of the caboose. This is an unusual locomotive, and I blurred the shot, but uh, the 8002 was the only unit on the BN that was painted in tiger stripes that was an SD40. Yes, there were tiger stripe GP50s, but SD40-2, the 8002, was the only one that got this scheme. Still a very rare catch. Yeah, real rare catch. And to get him on the lead, mm -hmm. I was pretty happy. And you've got a GEB unit yep. there, second out. One of the B30-7s, and then I think another 40-2 back there. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, I kind of like that scheme. It was a little unusual. Yeah. Then uh, GE's answer to the Oakway program with EMD, they came up with their LMX program, and they had 100 of these units that uh, were also in basically a pay by the kilowatt hour service. So, um, you know, basically there was a meter in the locomotive and for every kilowatt they used for moving, uh, moving trains, they paid to GE as a lease program. Uh, but seeing the LMX units uh, was not unusual. What was really unusual is to get an LMX unit and an Oakway engine together. I got it one time in Omaha and uh, the processing company screwed up my slides and cut them in the middle of the slide instead of on the each outside edge. So imagine this image being cut down the center horizontally and half of the previous image being on the top. And it was really irritating. But they gave me a free roll of film as a concession. I'm sure somebody at LaGrange <laughs> paid them to do that. Yeah, yeah. So here's a real grand coal train. Um, so you saw coal trains that ran to Texas that were BN trains, and you saw real grand coal trains that ran to Colorado Springs uh, and a little bit further south. But uh, remember, this was the same line as the Tennessee Pass line, really, when you think about the shape of the Rio Grand being in kind of a U with a, a, a piece across the top that was the Moffat Tunnel line. So when you talk about the BN being up here, mm -hmm. this is what you would, I believe, be referring to as the former Colorado and Southern. Correct. That was operating through this area. Yes, it would have been former CNS, uh, probably former CNS agreements. Um, but the line ran all the way down to, to uh, Fort Worth and then down to Southern Texas. So that became part of the Fort Worth and Denver also. So the BN merger between the Fort Worth and Denver, the Colorado and Southern, the CB and Q, and the SP and S kind of blended all this together. And by this era, of course, it was all just BN. Yes. 
here's a spot as we're getting now the train is actually climbing here uh, it looks like it's going downhill but it's definitely going uphill uh, and you can see this is one point where uh, the rear part of the train is on what I would call the former uh, Santa Fe and the front part of the train is on the former Rio Grande and you can see where the two switch positions at one point in the rail lines career um, so the, the bridge abutment that's over there, was right. that a realignment of the Santa Fe? Well, that was the original alignment of the Santa Fe. So the rear of the train is on the original alignment of Santa Fe. It went across the Rio Grande and continued where you can see that searchlight signal on the left-hand side. That was the former Santa Fe track. Yep. And then it went around the lake on the, on the left side or the east side of the, of the lake in Palmer Lake, where the Rio Grande then came south out of Palmer Lake on the west side and then switch places and continue down the hill then uh, or northbound uh, on the on the east side so this is just where the two lines had originally switched position but they had come up with a trackage agreement where they were going to run it as double track and during that alignment they just decided to, to get rid of the bridge and I'm not sure why if they, the bridge was old enough I've never seen a shot of the bridge at this location to see if it was something older that they just said it was easier to make a realignment than it would be to repair the bridge yeah so, but you can see a couple of ways in the lead there there's a little bit better shot of that steam locomotive you mentioned earlier like I say it was built in Mexico so this is one of those transfer trains uh, that came out of out of southern part of Denver down to the transcon um, with three three small units on it today must have had a pretty long train yeah Now we're kind of getting to the point where the Rio Grande and the SP um, had started to uh, develop a merger talks. Um, you know, the acquisition of the uh, of the SP and Rio Grande by the UP is what put them on eventually to the Tennessee Pass line, and of course access to all of the the uh, you know San Francisco Bay Area and so on. Um, but so talks between the SP and the Rio Grande had certainly begun by then and they were beginning to put their corporations together uh, this would have been around 1988 or so now well right so that was in the immediate wake of the other merger the SPSF merger right. falling that, apart when that fell apart right. right and then they went to the Rio Grande and said right let's make a deal right but as it turned out most of the operating uh, management side of it was from the Rio Grande perspective that even though the SP was bigger the Rio Grande was kind of calling the shots. Mm -hmm. So that second out engine has got just about every yeah, long hood door. I, I don't open. know if it was having uh, some overheating problems or what, but uh, yeah, that was doesn't a, look healthy. It's not unusual in mountain railroading to see a little extra cooling help with doors open. Yes, and of course, being in uh, mountain territory, you have to have helper cabooses too. Yes, <laughs> help shove over the hill. Right. Yeah, I don't know what the transfer move was here, but. Uh, couple of different extra cabooses styles. somewhere yeah, for some reason yep. I had to move them around so now here's another little transfer that took place in the afternoon for some reason this one particular car had to get down to the to the transcon out of out of Denver for the Santa Fe mm -hmm. um, who knows maybe it's somebody a I'll predict to you right now somebody's job was on the line yeah getting something that, getting that car moved maybe, by itself. maybe it was Coors beer you know who knows <laughs> who so. knows now we're over in Glenwood Springs. We're back on the Moffat route, although by this time the, um, the Tennessee Pass line would have also come together, so all, all the lines um, would be uh, together through Glenwood Springs. Uh, it wasn't unusual uh, Amtrak to add a Rio Grande GP40 or anything, Tunnel Motors and so on, uh, to help Amtrak keep time or to make up time across the mountains. Um, right, so when I see this, what I recall immediately is that Rio Grande was one of the railroads that did not initially join Amtrak didn't they they preserved some of their own passenger operations they did but that remember only that lasted till 1982 okay so by this point it was all it, the Amtrak had had moved their California Zephyr train from the Sherman Hill line of the UP down to the Rio Grande which was of course much more scenic than going over Sherman Hill 
Yes. Um, although, you know, Weber and Echo Canyon are very scenic for an Amtrak train to traverse. It's not near as pretty as Utah and, and Colorado. So by this time, Amtrak had been established on the Rio Grande's line for a lot of years. Now, okay. sometimes they put a pilot unit on the front because uh, Rio Grande would add their business cars to the rear of Amtrak. And it's possible on this day this may have been the case. I can't remember. I know that I had thrown in some shots of that coming up, but I don't remember if this was the reason here. Um, and of course, the California Zephyr in these days was a combination of three trains. You had the Desert Wind, which was a train that ran from Salt Lake City down to Los Angeles. And you had the Pioneer, which was a train that ran from um, basically up to Seattle and came together at Salt Lake City. Did I say all those correct? I think so. It ran it ran northwest. Yes. The Desert Wind ran north or southwest. Southwest. And then, of course, the California Zephyr ran into San Francisco. Right. So but they had one spot where they merged all three trains to run east. Right. And then the um, some of the trains, like the Pioneer was a tri-weekly train, where the Desert Wind was a daily train and the California Zephyr was a desert train. So depending which day you saw it, if they had the, the Pioneer section on there, it could become a really a long train. Mm -hmm. um, and so, hence, it was not unusual to see three or four F-40s on the trains during those days. Oh, okay, so the so the Rio Grande business cars were on the rear uh, yep. by this time. And that's probably why the G-40 had been added to help Amtrak keep time. Now we're back down to um, um, the Tennessee Pass line. This is the tunnel at the summit. Uh, this is going to be a, a westbound train. Uh, that's uh, his the rear of his train is still definitely on the hill these guys are pulling hard and even though the locomotives are on the downhill side most of the way to the train is still uh, definitely gravity's pulling it back down this is essentially shot from US Highway 24 I may have maybe I walked in 25 feet but it's uh, right now the um, the trains that went eastbound um, or, or southbound uh, definitely had 3%. But trains that were on the, uh, the east side or the northbound side only had to deal with 1.4%. So you didn't normally see a lot of helpers uh, on the other side of the tunnel, you know, down, down to the southern part of Colorado. Uh, the helpers were added in Minturn and, and re taken off just on the other side of this tunnel. Sometimes you would see helpers left on a train or added to the train. Uh, let's say that a helper set had pushed a train south um, and maybe sat in the siding and waited a while because there would be a, a westbound train that they would tag the helpers on the rear and just do some dynamic braking. Um, but in most cases, um, the, the, the trains that were headed west did not have helpers on them. This is the famous Mitchell Curves, uh, which is about... Oh, a third of the way down the hill on the three percent. You've got one. It looks like yeah. open sided. Yeah, auto open rack. auto rack. Well, maybe another one back up ahead. Looks like maybe two, but yeah, yeah. Some clouds shrouding the tops of the mountains. Yeah, that look. There's two more there, right on the head end. Yeah, this is the same train. Uh, I went down into Red Cliff. Uh, this always reminds me. It looks like a model railroad to me. The way the tight curves are and that yeah. really cool bridge it's on an angle it looks like he's got pickups there on that head end i think so to just a bi-level auto rack yeah looks like, is that a ford maybe is it yeah f-150s maybe you know, i think you're right here's a train coming up the hill now this is again after the the sp merger it was not unusual of course to see solid sets of sp power in the lead although they tended to keep the rio grande units as helpers. So here comes a guy up the hill around the Mitchell Curbs pulling super hard. Right. And this operation didn't last. It was only a few years. Yeah, it wasn't very long. And this was about the last year that I saw I was out there. Um, because the Rio Grande took over the SP or merged with the SP right. and they operated for maybe five years. Right. Now the Rio Grande or the SP merger with the UP did occur. Because if you remember, right towards the very beginning of the SP merger, but toward the end of this line, the 844 went over this line. It, yes. So, But because, that was right at the very end. Yeah, the UP did not operate it very no, long. No, they, they wanted to get rid of it in, in the worst way. Mm -hmm. 
but you can definitely tell that you, you're climbing hard here. This is, you know, in every hundred feet they climb three feet. So just about the length of one of those auto racks, you know, one ends two and a half feet higher than the other end. That's pretty steep. And of yeah. course the highway is really climbing. But it was a heck of a show. Yes. And you can just barely see the Rio Grande helper sets coming around the corner back there. Oh yes. Yep. All kinds of tunnel motors. Yeah, 45s. Basically, you know, the EMDs were still pretty much king out here. Mm -hmm. In terms of helper sets up the hill. Yep, and G had not yet stood. Oh, yeah, now we've got. <laughs> <laughs> we had talked about some engine problems. I'm sure that these guys are working really hard to get that 3,000 horsepower coaxed out of it. Uh huh. Uh, you know, not to mention they're dragging a dead unit. Trying to get every bit of horsepower started up they could. Right. But no, I was just saying, this is before GE had come out with their ES44s. That, oh, yeah. That really kind of changed the market again. Well, and, the, and this whole territory, you know, now, by the time we got to this point, 1988 or so, I was in the military. I you know I moved out of out, away from home. Uh, I started discovering that vacationing east was as interesting as vacationing west. It seemed closer. And mm -hmm. so this was one of the last few trips I made out to Tennessee Pass. But uh, my dad continued to go out there and has shots of, like, Wisconsin Central F-45s going over this line and, really? you know, UP, UP units going across the line. Uh, he did not go out for the 844 stuff. But, um, but so he's got, some, he's got some neat stuff, you know. Yeah. Tennessee Pass always remained interesting. It was just not something that I went out and, and did. So, What I think is most intriguing about this is you're still probably about, oh, I don't know, maybe four miles or so from the top. But this is obviously the engineer and the conductor or brakeman. And, uh, you know, these engines are running at run eight. Uh, they're not being controlled by the front set of locomotives. So, you know, if suddenly there was a dump of air, I don't know if these units would still stay in run eight or if, if by dumping the air in emergency, if it would shut them down. No, I when... Um when their air is going to be cut into the train line, and so when it go with the if it lost the air, the PCS would open and it would okay. cut power. Yeah, it would cut power. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I always thought this was a risky move. I didn't think about the fact that there was probably. So yeah, time. they're they're cut into the train line air for sure. So this is down the hill at Pando. Uh, I don't mean Pando. I'm sorry. At Minturn. Uh, Minturn was was a uh, home for. Uh, the helper operation and it was not unusual particularly in the earlier days when we would go there in the 70s to have two or three sets of helper power sitting around um, a lot of times it was three or four unit sets and again sometimes they push those sets together to make uh, you know these crazy eight and ten unit mid-train helpers but uh, this is a, a southbound westbound train that's just coming into town and he'll have his helpers added on and continue on this whole area here still has the tracks in place. The depot still stands, uh, but it's really been surrounded by housing and, and condos, and you're not very far from some of the big, bigger ski resorts in the area. We're only a few miles south of Interstate 70, and so you can see why some of these small towns that have become quite, um, what's the word that, uh, you know, preppy, it would be a word we probably would have used in the 80s, but uh, yes. uh, you can see why some of those folks would not necessarily want idling locomotives around anymore. You've got several examples of different Rio Grande lettering out here also. Right. Well, you've got yes. Yeah, so, so the original, the second unit there, where the where it has the that has the smaller flying Grand is was the original lettering, um, and then later on they were modernized with the like with the thirty one twenty four, and mm -hmm. then they bought some units from the um, uh, Conrail, and so the the color of the orange changed slightly. So the third unit, you can see that it's a little more of an orangey orange versus the yellow one. And then, of course, the fourth unit is the SD50s that were new to the Grand. They were their last new power. And by that point, they had adopted the more orangey logo, and therefore that's why they have that color. And, yeah. of course, then the fifth and sixth units are SP units. So a nice shot of the 3124. And that vent in the back is not the bathroom vent for the locomotive. <laughs> So this is now uh, back up on uh, uh, back up the hill or up the hill a little ways. This is a train that's uh, dynamic breaking down the hill. Uh, where I was taken from the shot of that Eagle River Canyon Bridge that I showed at the beginning of the sequence, um, and we're close to the little town of Gilman, uh, sort of by the Belson Mine. But uh, uh, this at this point in the 
earlier days, this was double track. Uh, by this moment, this was a, a, a sighting, passing sighting on the left-hand side, main on the right. And got lucky enough, this is the only time we ever got to meet in the canyon. Wow. You Not can, often you see the river in between the main and the siding. Right. And what I find most intriguing about this shot is that you look at some of the size of these giant boulders that have rolled off the canyon. You know, there's the, the second unit on the train coming toward us has got a big boulder that's just off the main. And you look down around the third, second car or so on the right-hand side, uh, you know, there's a big boulder in the water there. And, and if you get on Google Earth now and, and spend some time playing around on this line, you'll see there's a lot of places where there's been rock slides and and so on in the line you couldn't get a train through there right now without a whole bunch of no uh, there's expensive. there's a boulder the size of that one in the middle of the creek yeah that's blocking the main line right and so um you know people always said oh you know it'd be fun to go out and ride a motor car well you might have to carry the motor car across 200 yards of rock right. slide you know uh, and i think that um uh you know it took a constant maintenance in the tunnels uh there was always water and so on in the tunnels and uh, apparently uh, there's a I did see a YouTube video not long ago where there was a guy who had ridden a motor car through I think it was the Dean, Dean Tunnel which is up the hill a little ways and they got partway through and realized that the water had frozen over the tracks and that they were just going along the ice uh, <laughs> so they decided to kind of push back carefully and not go any further through the tunnel or they may have gotten their motor car stuck but right so, so you know you, you talked earlier about how how much of a hurry the UP was to get rid of operations over this thing. oh yeah just just another reason why honestly right right but you know they went out there every day with you know it was not in use to see putt-putt motor cars and so on on this line because they you know checked it constantly for slides and there were slide fences so they were fences that if a rock would would sever the wire on the slide fence it would set the signals red mm -hmm. um, and again you know track inspectors spend just a ton of time in the line of course these big boulders had to be removed with tractors or, or I shouldn't say tractors but you know excavators and, and dynamite and everything they could do to keep it open so right um, mid train helpers on the left hand side and of course the rear end going away from us on the right so we chased that first train back up the hill to Pando where we started uh, U.S. Highway 24 over the top, and I'll say we got an SD50 and a tunnel motor and an SD45, two SD45s in different paint schemes, and then it looks like either a little GP35 or GP40 back there. Yeah. So I really like the Rio Grande. I miss the Rio Grande. It was a it was a great railroad. They didn't they didn't do a lot of pooling, um, so you didn't see Rio Grande in other places. I mean, yes, there were certainly onesie twosies that did happen, but you know, solid consists of Grands only stayed on the Grand, and you didn't see. A lot of other railroads you didn't see a lot of bn power you didn't see a lot of of you know up power and again after the merger you saw a lot more of that but you know in its day the grand was the grand and that was it so yep and i always like sd45 so only appropriate to pick those out yes oh it was a 35 so yep jeep 35 and here's his helpers he had four around the Mitchell curves again always a scenic spot because regardless you had good sun angle and it was fun to see the train wind across itself mm -hmm. here's another shot of Amtrak in Colorado, Colorado I'm sorry in Glenwood Springs uh, pretty good sized train and what I consider to be my favorite Amtrak paint scheme which was the phase three where the red white and blue stripes were equal uh, thickness or equal uh, size oh yeah and at the lounge car the striping went up into the windows instead of straight across but I always like that scheme. Those uh, GE Pepsi cans? They didn't, they I didn't mind the Pepsi can, but I, for some reason I just always like this Phase 3 scheme. I don't know why. But All right. Another set of Grand Power coming around the corner there. Jeep 35 and some tunnel motors. Looks like a Jeep 30 here, 3022. Oh, yeah. This was my final sequence on Tennessee Pass. Um, I went out there one time in about 19... Uh, I think it was around 1992 or 93, uh, and was was at the point in my life after I got out of the service where I actually probably could climb a hill and not be winded at 10,400 feet, um, but uh, climbed up to get a nice shot of, uh, of the last train I shot on Tennessee Pass and Highway 24. 
Yeah, if you were out here in 1992, then this line didn't have much life left not in it. Not much gone. Yeah, but not much left. And by this time, I think I graduated to a different camera. Um, I don't remember what that one was now that I think about it. I think it was uh, a, a 10S, a Canon 10S. I've always been a Canon guy, mostly because the lenses were interchangeable. Even to this day, I still shoot a Canon digital if I don't use my cell phone for photographs. Mm -hmm. you know, nowadays, our, our cell phone probably takes a better image than this. Not a better subject, but right. a better image. <laughs> For sure. Ascending toward the... So he's still, he's still climbing. Uh, yep, he's toward the, the tunnel. The summit tunnel here, southbound, eastbound. Uh, here's his helpers. Yep. And then on the other side is a siding, and this guy must have been over there. And somehow I must have known that. Either we were going to chase it, and I went, oh, gosh, there's a train coming the other way. So here's his... Uh, here's a train that's pulling hard to get his rear of the train over the hill and then he'll be in full dynamics is is you that know. the um the fans from inside the tunnel blowing out all that nope nope that is strictly just uh smoke from from the units uh not being able to breathe real well and then as they as the train kind of pulls the air through as it's pulling through then the tunnel uh right. releases the smoke was this was this a, fa a tunnel that had a fan house to it? At one no? point it did. The fan, the, the, um, the on the other side, there was some kind of a, uh, a curtain that could close and could blow fans through, but I never saw it in operation. Okay. So it was it was out of operation even when we were starting coming out there in the 1970s. Sure. So we chased him down the hill, and, and this is a, our final shot here in uh, Red Cliff, uh, uh, the Tennessee Pass line. And that's it. Well, thank you very much, Darren. I think this is... This has been very enjoyable. Obviously, this is this is an amazing subject matter. You're out in here in the mountains in Colorado, and it's just beautiful. Yeah, it's great territory. And you just can't find this anymore. The this is this is a piece of railroad that literally has not been operated for twenty plus years now. Yeah, and and there's always something fascinating about mountain railroading, whether it's the you know was the former Conrail or Pensy or you know today's modern Norfolk Southern over Horseshoe, and you know just all those places. It's a uh, it's it's always been fun. Um, Yes. I mean, railroad in general, when it's in your blood, you can make anything interesting. But, right. Um, should we talk about what's happening next month? With yes. So next month is going to be Lou Schmitz, which is going to be a steam era, early diesel era program. And that should be something that uh, I think people are going to get a real kick out of. There's some really rare photography there. Um, it was this Northwestern stuff, an Omaha route. Um, what else? A little bit of IC. Yes, CGW. Uh, CGW, mostly kind of around the Omaha, Council Bluffs area. Western Iowa. Western Iowa, okay, yep. great. Sounds yes, good. Uh, so that, that program has been made available to us. Dana, Schmitt, Dana Grief helped Lou Schmitz do some scanning prior to Lou passing away, and okay. so we have access to that. And Yes, we're going to be able to do some, some uh, scans of some of it, almost 100-year-old material that wow. we're going to get to see. That'll be fun. Here's a secret. We already pre-recorded that one before this one. Yes. <laughs> All We're right. doing this out of order. Uh, way but, out of order. But, but you're going to enjoy it, we promise. Yes, we will see you next month for sure. Yes, thank you.